Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday. In fact, it's the last Wellness Wednesday for 2020. On behalf of our entire team, Allison O2, our Executive Director, Anne Marie Medina, our Director in Tucson, and I'm Caroline Berger, Director here in Phoenix. We want to welcome you to this week's session. And to get things started, we have a special message from Dr. Michael Dake, who serves as our Senior Vice President for Health Sciences. There we go, just a nice holiday message um, from our family to yours. And for more information on uh, University of Arizona Health Sciences, please feel free to check out uahs.arizona.edu. And be sure to follow us on all of our social media outlets. We have lots of news and information coming out, particularly around the new developments and research around COVID-19. And I invite you to follow me on Twitter and my handle at CEBurger. Love to see and hear from you. Today, we want this to be engaging and interactive. So after today's presentation, we invite you to leave a question or a comment in our chat section. We'll have a few moments to go through those today. And also, we're gonna be following up with you after today's session with a post-session email, which is going to include a link to a very brief survey. We ask that you please take time to fill this out. It's really important to us to hear your thoughts and comments about Wellness Wednesday today, but also for the future. This is how we come up with our topics and our presenters is from your comments and recommendations. Also, don't worry about taking notes today. In this email, follow-up email, you'll also get all the links and resources that are presented here today, including a YouTube link for today's presentation that you can share with families and friends, and also links to all of our past sessions in case you happen to miss them or want to go back for some refreshing tips and information. So without further ado, let's welcome our last presenter for 2020, Andy Belzer, who is the Director of School of School of Theater, Film and Television at the University of Arizona College of Fine Arts, and also a certified Feldenkrais practitioner. Today, he's going to be talking about awareness through movement, improving your health and life using the Feldenkrais method. Andy, take it away. Thank you. Um, can you all, can you see the slideshow? Not yet. Okay, so I need permission to share. There you go. There we go. Can you see it now? Mm-hmm. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Andy Belser. I, um, as uh, Caroline said, I'm the director of the School of Theater, Film, and Television. And I've had a long career as a director in uh, theater and film. And since a very young age, I would say about 20, I have taken an interest in the body and the work of um, training actors and training um, people uh, from outside of theater and film um, to be healthier and more aware of themselves. Um, I will say at the outset, one of the uh, biggest uh, problems with the Feldenkrais method is the name Feldenkrais because Honestly, Moshe Feldenkrais developed a method that was way before its time in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And um, part of my work, I should say, has been over the last 15 years has been to do research. I was working at Penn State and I was working with a neuroscientist there. And I have a book about to come out around linking neuroscience and acting. I came on to the Feldenkrais method years ago through a back injury, and it was the only thing that I found that helped me. 
And what I can tell you is um, the Feldenkrais method is a natural, um, it, it, in some ways it's a nervous system hack, forget it that, that it's called the Feldenkrais method. And just it, to me, it's the way we uh, learn and move. So I'm gonna give you an introduction to it, um, an overview. The Feldenkrais method is uh, two interrelated somatic based education methods. And somatic simply means one's own body, the awareness of one's own body. The, the, so there's two parts to it. The first is the one that we'll be practicing, awareness through movement. This is taught in group settings. It almost always has a facilitator. Um, I will be teaching a section of this, or an eight part series of this here on the Tucson campus that will be streaming as well. And the second part is called functional integration. And this is hands-on one-on-one -on -one work. But as I said, in this series, we will only be practicing awareness through movement. So I'm gonna give you an overview of awareness through movement and I really won't talk today about uh, functional integration. I'm taking this, um, this introduction through um, a fellow named Norman Deutsch, who wrote a book called um, The Brain's Way of Healing. He has one of the best summaries of uh, the Feldenkrais method in that book. And you'll see me quoting from him quite a lot in this presentation. Um, sometimes he uses Feldenkrais's own words and um, sometimes he, he has just really framed uh, quite elegantly what Feldenkrais was about. So this is an 11 part um, uh, points that Deutsch has summarized, used to summarize. So the, mind, the first point is that the mind programs the functioning of the brain. And um, so this is Deutsch's own words. When we have experience, Feldenkrais wrote, the neural substrate or the neuronal connections in the brain organize, it organizes itself. Feldenkrais often said, as his student David Zamak Burson points out, that when there is a neurological in injury, plenty of brain matter usually remains to take over the damaged functions. This has been over and over again proven out with stroke victims and victims of other kinds of healing from other kinds of injury, brain or otherwise. Um, I studied with David Zamak Burson for a number of years, um, but um, the, and there on the bottom, you can see the title of the book, The Brain's Way of Healing by Norman Deutsch. So Moshe Feldenkrais was, um, is really regarded quite a lot now as a, as a prefigure, a person who prefigured the discovery of neuroplasticity. So I'm gonna talk just for a moment about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change throughout life. Now you might just call this learning. And in fact, it is learning, but, the, but what Feldenkrais understood is that the brain has to map itself. So if I lose touch with, let's say, through a stroke with my right hand, I need to develop structurally through axonal connections from my brain to, to connect with my hand. I need to bring my hand back into um, the mapping. The, I need to be able to, to control it. Um, this is really important. And I will say a really interesting thing about neuroplasticity is if you read the literature from the 60s and 70s, it was really on the fringe of neuroscience. And now it is positively mainstream. Neuroplasticity is a discovery of neuroscience in the last two or three decades that is among the most um, fantastical discoveries that we know is that throughout life, this never changes. Throughout life, as long as we're alive, we have the the ability to structurally change our uh, nervous system. I'm happy to answer many more questions about um, neuro about neuroscience as well. I mean, I'm I'm not a neuroscientist, but about the connections of neuroscience to this work. So, a brain cannot think without motor function. Now, there's a lot of linguistic work going on around this, and this is one element that Deutsch it's about even thinking of making a movement triggers the movement, even if very subtly. So we know from brain scans that if I think of the word um, dig, 
or or um, jump, my brain, the motor function of my brain is already activated. I may not activate the muscles very significantly, but that thought is deep, that thought is deeply connected with motor function. And this is a key to understanding um, how to change ourselves because I think contemporary culture uh, has taught us to think of our, our bodies as machines. And that's just not at all the case. Our bodies are deeply connected with our brains. And in fact, um, embodied cognition is an area of neuroscience that I will talk a little bit about, not today, but through the, through the um, series. So awareness of movement is the key to improving movement. It's not repetition. It's not doing things faster or stronger or no pain, no gain. It's actually awareness. And again, this is being proven out again and again by neuroscience. This is again from Norman Deutsch. Sensation's purpose is to orient, guide, help control, coordinate, and assess the success of a movement. The kinesthetic sense plays a key role in assessing the success of a movement and gives immediate sensory feedback about where the body and limbs are in space. That kinesthetic sense is what we might call simply awareness of movement. And we do it all the time. We do it when we're walking, let's say we're walking on a sidewalk that has uneven, um, you know, joints or is slanting up because a tree came up from under it, we begin to, maybe we stumble and we have a kinesthetic sense that we've lost our balance. We quickly assess that and that sensory feedback allows us to say, where am I going now? How am I gonna correct this? In fact, that trial and error is really important to um, learning. I will say, I'm not gonna show you any videos of awareness through movement, but if you simply, uh, go to YouTube and look up ATM or a Feldenkrais Awareness Through Movement, you'll see plenty of them and you can sort of see what it's about. I will caution you though, seeing what it's about is very different than experiencing it. Feldenkrais often said, if you know what you are doing, you can do what you want. We hear this when we're trained over four years in this work. We hear this over and over and over again. And we, when we work with clients, we say it again and again. Become aware of what you're doing and you can do what you want. And that's a brain thing. That's, that's an entire whole self thing. But the brain needs to develop stronger maps of what you're doing. That's what we mean when we say know what you're doing. So differentiation, making the smallest possible sensory distinctions between movements, builds brain maps. I'm going to read that again because this is very different than a lot of movement training. Differentiation, sensing the difference, making the smallest possible sensory distinctions between movements, build brain map, builds brain maps. So when I was learning to uh, take dance classes, I was not taught this. I was not taught to do things in a very small way, but we know from working with stroke victims, let's say, that a stroke patient can only learn, can only build a brain map very, very slowly. And if we introduce too big of a movement or introduce it too fast, the entire movement session or therapy session can become a washout. You need to build maps slowly. Now, if you think about it, this is how we all learned to crawl. It's how we all learned that we have hands and feet in our, in our cribs when we were little. So this is again from Norman Deutsch. Feldenkrais found repeatedly that when a body part is injured, its representation in the mental map becomes smaller or even disappears. By making very finely tuned differentiated movements of these parts and paying close attention while doing so, people experience them, them subjectively as becoming larger. They take up more of their mental maps and lead to more refined brain maps. That is the key to what we're trying to do, is to slowly bring ourselves into new movement possibilities. And it, it, this work is used a lot for healing. Um, you know, it, it, in my class in New York City, about half or more of the people 
we're high level physical therapists working with um, people with um, you know, neurological function uh, issues or even just serious injuries. So differentiation is easiest to make when the stimulus is smallest. And this is not just with movement, this is also with vision. Here, Moshe Feldenkrais was borrowing from a law called the Weber-Fechner law. The Weber-Fechner law is, is, is essentially determined that when, that the minimal changes in a stimulus is, that our senses can detect is the most important amount. So for example, if I gave you a 50 pound weight and asked you to hold it and then put a pencil on top, you would not feel that because your body is already feeling a lot of stimulus from the lift of that 50 pounds. But if I put a postcard on your hand and you felt the weight of the postcard, you definitely could feel a pencil, but you probably could even feel another postcard. It's those small distinctions that are the traffic of the brain building maps. It's the small distinctions. Again, I don't know about you, but in athletics and in my own artistic training, I was not taught this. And I was taught more pain, do it more, do it better, do it over and over, not to detect smaller and smaller. You can, you can also detect this through vision. The Weber-Fechner law applies to if you can, if you're washed out with light, adding a little bit of light to it will not change you. But if you are in a very low light room, turning on one little light bulb, you will be able to notice. So it's, it's, a, it's about smallness in stimulus. Slowness, slowness of movement is the key to awareness and awareness is the key to learning. This is one of the hardest things to learn when you're first taking out Feldenkrais. It's been very conditioned that I must do more in, in yoga and a lot of people, I mean, when I've taught this now for a number of years and boy, everyone wants to do more and more and more. And Feldenkrais would often say, I, not only do I want you to do less, sometimes I don't want you to do anything. I want you to only imagine the movement. And you can actually learn this work by imagining movement. I recommend moving, learning to move very, very small and incrementally, and you will build those brain maps. As Feldenkrais put it, the delay between thought and action is the basis for awareness. When two sensory or motor events occur repeatedly and simultaneously in the brain, they become linked because neurons that fire together, wire together and the brain maps for those actions merge. So this is why when we're, let's say driving and we become tense, we, we pull ourselves into a lot of action. That's a lot of different actions coming together. We call it tension, generalized tension, but Feldenkrais would say, become aware of each of those little actions slowly, become aware of them, and you have a chance to begin to diminish them. But you can't just say to someone, relax, because there's too many actions going on in the whole self. I can answer about this after I finish here as well. So in awareness through movement, we are reminding ourselves or relearning that we use slow, easy movements to re-educate our kinesthetic sense. These slowness of movements also require that we reduce the effort whenever possible. Again, most people, when they begin awareness through movement, do too much, thinking, well, I'm not doing enough, so I'm not gonna learn. Norman Deutsch says, when we eliminate a lot of muscle tension in the body by using awareness to spot we can, sorry, we can eliminate a lot of muscle tension in the body by using awareness to spot how we often, without intending to do so, tense and use muscles that are not necessary for that movement. Feldenkrais called these movements superfluous or parasitic. So I have a 21 year old son and a 23 year old son. And when they tell me they have a lot of tension, particularly sitting through Zooms, I'm often retraining them saying, how are you using yourself in front of the computer? They often just want me to rub their shoulders and I sometimes do that. But 
I, they're now beginning to understand this parasitic extra movement that they're doing. Number eight, errors are essential and there is no right way to move, only better ways. So people often come into practice with we Feldenkrais practitioners and say, oh, I don't move well, or I, I know I'm whatever. They, we're often very aware of these ways that we think we move poorly. Feldenkrais would say the body, the human being can move in many, many ways. And there's no perfect or right way to move. There are only better ways. And the better ways often have to do with efficiencies, the structural efficiencies of the, the way the skeleton and the muscles are put together in relationship to gravity. Again, Deutsch, in ATM less lessons, he encouraged people, pupils to set aside critical faculty. Feldenkrais would say, don't you decide how to do the movement. Let your nervous system decide. I love that quote. How would we even know how to let our nervous systems decide? That's what ATM is about, is learning that. Number nine, random movements provide variation that leads to developmental breakthroughs. Random movements provide variation that lead to developmental breakthroughs. Okay, this is a long quote and I kept it, but I kept it in here because there's a lot of good information here. Learning to stand and walk are momentous breakthroughs that infants make without training. Years after Feldenkrais made this discovery, Dr. Esther Thielen, arguably the world's leading scientist of motor development, de demonstrated that every child learns to walk in a different way by trial and error, and not, as was thought, through a standard hardwired program applicable to all. Thielen revolutionized the scientific understanding of motor development, but when she discovered Feldenkrais had said as much, she was totally awed by his clinical discoveries. And she told Feldenkrais's students, I think that the science may seem rather crude compared to the kind of intuitive, hands-on brain knowledge you people have. She then trained as a Feldenkrais practitioner. Again, you'll get a copy of all of this in the YouTube video. Number 10, even the smallest movement in one part of the body involves the entire body. I would say that this is um, probably derived from martial arts, judo, tai chi, jujitsu, where they routinely teach you, pay attention to what your toes are doing when you wanna make your hand move through the air, or your breath. And number 11, many movement problems and the pain that goes with them are caused by learned habit and not by abnormal structure. This is also another hard thing to learn because we've been told that there's some, I have some uh, structural problem, but often it's the habits that have accompanied that structural problem throughout life. Most conventional treatments assume that function is wholly dependent on the underlying bodily structure and its limitations. Feldenkrais discovered that his pupils' difficulties were caused as much by how their brains learned to adapt to their structural abnormalities as by the abnormalities themselves. And I see this over and over again. I worked with a, a person who had really severe um, um, curvature of the spine, scoliosis. And she just kept saying, my scoliosis is getting in the way. And I kept saying, it's your adaptation to the scoliosis. And she really discovered that. I had another young woman who had a knee replacement at a very young age from a serious soccer and then skiing injury. And she thought that that was um, insurmountable, that that structural abnormality of a replaced knee in their 20s um, was, um, would cause her to interrupt her acting and dancing and singing career. In fact, um, it was the way she learned to use herself after those injuries. So this is a little bit of a summary, attention and attitude. In awareness through movement, the turning of attention inward allows us to sense and feel ourselves and foster self-knowledge. And open expanded attention and attitude are crucial for learning and unfolding. 
It's not a try harder. It's opening oneself. So if you're going to participate in the series streaming, um, which will start in January and February, there'll be an eight part series. All you need is a quiet space where you can give undivided attention to your movement, sensation, action, thoughts, emotions. It could, it, you don't need a lot of space to move around. You know, a bedroom, a small bedroom would be just fine. You would need a mat or a blanket if you're going to lay down on the floor comfortably. And a lot of these uh, awareness through movement lessons are on the floor. Yoga mat is just fine. And you will need a chair for one or two lessons, but every single lesson can be adapted to do in any position. And I'll, I will go over this when we, when we talk. So that's, um, that's all I have. I'm gonna stop my screen share now and, um, and entertain questions. Wonderful. And we invite you to leave your questions in the chat box there. Um, I do have a couple that already came in earlier. Sure. Um, Andy, just to go. Are breathing techniques incorporated into the Feldenkrais method? Yes, not only techniques, but the linkage of breathing with the entire nervous system is incorporated. And one of the most beautiful things about Moshe Feldenkrais's work is that he began to understand the habitual patterns of breathing as they were linked to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And the sympathetic nervous system is what often in books is called the fight flight. It's the action readying nervous system. So we end up looking at a lot of tension through the breath. But yes, there are many, many breath exercises. Wonderful. Now, you mentioned a little bit about yoga. So one of yep. the questions was, how does any comparison to Tai Chi? A lot of comparison to Tai Chi or or the training toward Tai Chi. There are a lot of um, masters of Feldenkrais teaching who are also Tai Chi either masters or longtime students. It, it, it's, as I said, I would, I like to think of Feldenkrais as nervous system work. That is just true because it's, it is true. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't think of it, even though I'm trained in the method, I prefer like, Tai Chi is essentially is a very similar thing, approach where you're, you're moving very, very slowly, looking at the differentiation and tuning into how am I moving in this way? So the, the, these things link perfectly. This would help a yoga practice, by the way, beautifully. And it'll help long drives. It'll help any functions you want to do, golfing, um, you know, basketball, sitting for long period, playing violin, anything. That's wonderful. Um, we are getting some questions here. And just to let you know, we're getting ready to share information about the series that Andy mentioned. Sure. So you'll have that information. Um, can you please explain the parasitic habit movement? You mentioned you're someone, your sons get stressed out of, um, <laughs> you know, the Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. do you spot and correct this? What, well, what you have to do is um, begin to become aware of the parasitic movement. That's a kind of a frustrating thing, though, because once I, I'll just talk about myself. When I sit in front of a screen, I often find myself doing this, which is moving toward the screen. That's a, that's a not necessary movement. It's a parasitic movement, but it brings my head way in front of my hips and it keeps my spine in action. What I have to do is begin to pull that apart. And this is what awareness through movement lessons do. So now I'm much more aware of all the little pieces and parts that are involved in this. It's not one movement, it's many. So if we're looking at parasympathetic or, or parasitic movement, we want to know what is parasitic. Like, what am I actually trying to do? And how can I do it as an organized whole efficiently and without involving so much other tension? This is why athletes love the Feldenkrais method. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. And something that sounds like we all could use about now um, as we go through oh. so, <laughs> this virtual environment. Um, another question, is this valuable for patients with Parkinsonism? Oh my gosh, so good. I've worked with people with Parkinson's and you know, as you might know, um, and I don't wanna wade into this because again, I'm not a neuroscientist, but. Parkinson's has been studied functionally some remedies 
around the sequence of movement patterns. And if we can put together the sequence and awareness in different ways, the, the brain body organiz, organization can move without those interruptions that Parkinson's in, introduces. So I've seen Parkinson's um, patients become in, locked in and frozen and through Feldenkrais, it gives them a different pathway to organize their movement. Music plays a big role in that. So sometimes I'll use Feldenkrais and music with people who have Parkinson's, but uh, any range of neurological conditions, cerebral palsy, MS, all kinds of things. Uh, Feldenkrais is often a thing that they find, people find help in. That's wonderful. Um, another question for you, I wanted to know, are you a somatic yoga trainer too? No, no, I'm not. I mean, I would love to be, but you know, Life is short. I, I'm trained in a lot of different practices, and um, but I would I would say uh, Feldenkrais is. If you took a Feldenkrais practice toward yoga, you would be a somatic yoga teacher essentially. And I know that there's specific training in that regard, but um, the approach can per be perfectly blended with yoga. Mm -hmm. um, another question: Can movement be used for Alzheimer's patients? Actually, Norman Deutsch's book addresses this. And I had a very large project that I did um, for about a decade, um, working with aging and Alzheimer's. And we, they have found now that if you put um, people suffering with Alzheimer's in movement, in regular movement patterns, like motor memory takes over, particularly with their friends. So for example, we took them up in the hills with a, on a hike they will come back and often report, I didn't feel like I had Alzheimer's on that hike because the motor patterns are part of the memory patterns. So yes, I have not personally worked with um, like in a session, functional integration or awareness through movement with people that I knew had Alzheimer's. But I have a friend whose mom has Alzheimer's and when I hold her hand, I'm always doing Feldenkrais with her and she loves it. Wonderful. Well. We are getting lots of questions about the series. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you see that? So maybe you could talk a little bit about the series that's coming up, Andy. Sure. I'm going to take people, the group. I'm going to teach a, a group of uh, people in the Health Science Innovation Building on the Tucson campus. Um, about six people, eight people. Uh, I'll be teaching them live and then streaming that live teaching class. I found that teaching goes better if you're actually teaching a live class rather than in this format. Mm -hmm. So I'll teach eight different sessions. Some of them will be um, things like, uh, you know, efficient sitting or driving. Some of them will be things like walking. Some of them will be around pain management or how do I learn how to learn? Like, how do I continue with this work? because really this work is about your own learning. So I'll be addressing that through eight sessions. And I'll give you, Feldenkrais has 2000 or over 2000 awareness through movement lessons. And they're all amazing. Like I've done about a thousand of them. I'm gonna be teaching eight of those. So there's a lot more to go through. With just the beginning. And is there a cost? No. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Andy, for joining sure. us and sharing us and introducing us to this wonderful method. Um, for those of you, this is, as I said, this is our last webinar for the year. We're going to take a little break between webinars, but we have one scheduled already for January 13th. And we invite you to join us to kick off a new year with Building Better Mental Health in 2021, featuring Jenny Tesso, who is a mental health counselor, at the University of Arizona Health Sciences Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So please mark your calendars and be free, uh, share, be sure, there we go, to join us. However, we're still with you through the holidays. So please join us and celebrate. We're celebrating health and holiday with our free email series, which is coming out now through January 5th. So sign up and I'll include the registration link in our email. Um, make sure you sign up so that every Wednesday you'll receive this great information to help you get through with exercises, recipes, stress reducing techniques, which we can probably all use about this time. And also every week we're going to be drawing a prize winner. So could be your lucky week. So make sure you register when you see that link in our post email. 
So on behalf of Allison, and marie and myself, we want to thank you all for your support of Wellness Wednesdays. It has just been a delight for us to be able to offer this series and to continue to grow and enhance it. On behalf of all of us, we want to wish you and your family and your loved ones the happiest of holiday seasons. Take care, and as always, a gentle reminder to stay safe, bear down, and masks up. Thank you all so much.